Um, this is the first of three of these that we're doing. Uh, we're doing a second run of the introduction um, probably in March and then a uh, advanced version of this in July next year, so watch for those. Uh, our presenters today are myself, Brian Rowe. I'm at Northwest Justice Project here in-house in Seattle. I run the National Technology Assistance Project. We've got Jeff Hogue and Xander Karsten. Uh, Jeff, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, my name is Jeff Hogue. I work on community relations and operations here at Legal Server, a case management system. I was, uh, you know, I did, I worked in legal aid for, gosh, 14 years, and then um, gradually technology became more and more part of my mission. And so now I work with uh, uh, groups around the country who have Legal Server and help them. I think we, we try to add uh, looking at systems and how they do things as part of uh, um, as, as part of that job. And then I also um, uh, am the co-chair of the NLADA tech section. So we worked with, uh, as LSE was revising them, we gave them uh, information and along with Brian helped hold some forums so that people had feedback on what happened with the baselines. Yeah, and, and Jeff's really career path here in being kind of an accidental techie lawyer that ended up taking over the tech for a program is very typical. It's one of the reasons that I really wanted him on this uh, discussion. A lot of programs start out with that same situation. Uh, Xander. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Xander Karsten. I'm also a uh, legal aid attorney turned uh, technology person. I, did, I was in direct service for about four years and then went to uh, Pro Bono Net where I was the law help program coordinator for almost three years before I came into Legal Server and um, spend a lot of time with folks who are coming onto Legal Server, taking a look at their various processes, how they do their work, and kind of talking through um, you know different ways of implementing that. Um, and you know was interested in the baselines, have been um, kind of tangentially um, watching it as sort of the baselines themselves sort of um, unfolded and came about and was excited when I was asked to join the panel today. And for a little, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Sander. Um, a little bit of history over the baselines. Um, these baselines were updated last year uh, based on the 2008 baselines. Um, there were significant changes to them. Uh, David Bonebrae, Glenn Rodden, Jane, Ruben Nera all put in significant work on it along with Idealware and Laura Quinn. Um, these are significantly updated and very solid resource for us. Um, the order that we're going to be going through these, if you have downloaded the handout, which is the full baselines um, in the handout section here, we're just going to be walking through them in order of the document. We've got some visuals to go with it, um, but one of the things that uh, we would like is any, any questions as we go along, comments, anything that you would like to add on to it. One of the first things that's in here is really a whole section on um, planning and having a technology plan that should be reviewed on a yearly basis. Um, Jeff, what, what does one of those technology plans look like? What type of stuff do you typically see in it? Well, you know, LSC um, put out some guidance on tech plans and what a lot of people did is just take their, take their outline and put in some answers. Um, we shared some a little bit in New York, and I um, uh, it'll have everything from uh, it sh should have what your major initiatives are, um, resources, and and nowadays my guess is that the tech plans are starting to to track the baselines. It sure it wouldn't be a bad uh, taxonomy of them. I think um, you know they probably suffer. I think one of the reasons that there's a recommendation to review it each year is that they suffer from the, ooh, we got that done, it goes in a drawer problem. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can check that box. We have a technology plan. As we all know, it can be really difficult to, if you, as you get busy, to remember in September that in January you said this was the year that you were going to try to look at document management systems or something like that. But that's mm -hmm. uh, 
general, that's I, what what we've seen the most is something like that, as opposed to haven't seen I haven't seen any that are like two page. Here's the broad strokes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one one of the things that's worked well for us at Northwest Justice Project is trying to um, put that into the same processes where we're reviewing our uh, budget reporting for TIG or other reporting so that we can update it while we're also kind of reviewing what was done in the last year or two years or three years with regards to grants. Um, one of the things that's in the same section here is also um, having some type of a uh, technology staff and the recommendations in here um, are a little bit on the uh, conservative side, they're very helpful though, and they're two full-time staff per hundred FTE, and that can be full-time or uh, consultants. There was a lot of discussion as the baselines were put together on whether or not those needed to be in-house, and we've we've seen different organizations do it differently. And it's very typical of the way that the baselines are set up is that um, they're more general guidelines and less exactly specific how to implement something. Um, what, Xander, what are some of the reasons um, and what type of things would these like full-time staff be doing? Why, why is it important to have this level of staffing? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, having a couple of people who are dedicated just to, you know, sort of your technology can assist when you both um, for some continuity um, pieces, but having, you know, um, having some dedicated time for um, staff to both get trained up and to have a couple of people who um, who have a major role in making sure that staff are trained, making sure that staff, that other staff have um, available resources, and also that you have people who are, you know, kind of responsible for all looking ahead and being up to date on some of the um, technology changes that are coming down the pike can be really helpful. And also just having, you know, one or two people, um, I think, really helps to have a unified tech plan where if you have, if it's part of um, a couple of different people's jobs or maybe it is um, responsibilities that rotate, it's harder for people to dig in and really get familiar with both um, the quirks of how an agency may use technology, but also to be able to kind of distinguish what will work well and what won't within an agency and their own staffing. Excellent. Um, so some of the things that they really talk about here is the uh, maintaining equipment and networks, maintaining database software, um, support and training for staff, and we're going to cover training in a lot more uh, depth, but just even the strategic planning stuff that we've already talked about um, is it's very difficult to do without um, someone who kind of sees that institutional history and can look forward in a long-term plan. If, if that rotates around a lot, it, it's a skill that can be a little bit difficult for someone to pick up in a short period of time and, and run with. Um, and Brian, I, I wanted to add that just keeping up with what's going on is really has to be part of that person's job. Just like as a lawyer, part of their job is to keep up with what's coming out of the highest court in the land and what the, those mm -hmm. developments are. Just keeping up with, you know, finding out that some popular solution people are adopting is not working out well, or there's a huge security breach. You know, like what what does Heartbleed the Heartbleed virus mean and flaw mean for us is. Um, mm -hmm. It really takes someone who, who who's going to pay attention to those things, and I should say that number. Although I have my MLADA hat on, and it's it's not a thou shalt. Um, that number is is very small compared to what we see in private practice. Mm -hmm. And even even in other areas of nonprofits, it it is a conservative number there. Um, no, I, I think. We're going to cover security a little bit later, but that is essential to be ahead of those type of things and have someone who is dedicated to monitoring what are the possible security holes, flaws, updates in our system and being able to proactively patch and maintain those before there is a data breach when you're dealing with such sensitive client data. Um, in the in the same area, there's also um, a budgeting section that really covers um, three different things: maintenance and upgrades of hardware and software, uh, personal 
personnel um, consultants, so this is the FTEs that are supported in program, um, and training uh, for use of technology as part of training, not only for the person who is in charge of this, but also for the staff overall. Um, I've got a question for uh, Xander or Jeff. If, if you're in a smaller program at that kind of 10 to 30 or 40 person range, um, how, how do you deal with these uh, technology staffing um, issues? How does that come to be in an organization? In the smaller organizations, one of the things that I've definitely seen um, that has worked is a, a part-time uh, individual who is who does technology and then um, outsources some of the uh, security or help desk particular responsibilities and that they tend to focus on the uh, budgeting planning long term because uh, it's very difficult with smaller organizations to have one full-time member especially when you get to the 10, 20, 30 uh, person range but having some type of a support staff or organization consultant outside can help fill in those gaps at those smaller sizes. Yeah, and I think, you know, generally, especially when you're uh, looking of those three, that, that training piece um, is one that tends to be really important um, to keep in-house or to have um, at least have folks who know your staff well to do that training. It's um, you know it's definitely one thing to have you know somebody who does the someone outside the organization who does that help desk, but actually training and being able to identify what training your staff may need is something that tends to really be helpful coming from um, from the staff themselves or from someone who's very familiar with them. Mm -hmm. At, at NJP, we, we have somebody who kind of uh, facilitates and then finds uh, speakers that uh, on different areas, but is, is aware of and kind of keeps a calendar of that. So we'll bring in an expert in Word or an expert in security and ethics or something like that, um, but they're, they put together an entire calendar for the year. It's, it's similar to the way that um, CLEs are offered through our organization, but these are different tech topics that we um, try to schedule throughout the year. So the next topic that is covered here is one of the more um, in-depth ones and could easily be a topic of three or four webinars. Um, this is on um, case management systems and in the baselines there's a, a very long list of some basic functionality uh, to be aware of there. Um, one thing that people should also be aware of is that LSNTAP has a uh, series of pages for each of the major uh, case management systems with links to their um, systems, their uh, websites, and uh, for two of them we also have uh, demo videos available on YouTube to see them. Um, but some of the basic things that are covered is be able to retain client eligibility, case type and appropriate data for intake, secure backups, screen applicants, perform conflict checks, um, enter and edit information in real time, securely and ethically transfer client data, um, generate reports, the ability to assign funding codes, um, and allow end users to configure various aspects of the uh, case management system. Um, Sandra, what are what are some of the things that um, are worth looking into when somebody is looking at a case management system and they're they're comparing what's out there? So I think you know generally um, this is a really good kind of checklist to just take to whatever um, software management systems you're going to. Uh, you're going to use. The other thing that I think um, is really important is to talk about what ongoing support is available um, regardless of the system that uh, that you are looking at that you know these the the needs and capacities and functions are, are really important and they're laid out really well um, sort of throughout here the, um, but one thing that isn't necessarily addressed is, you know, that kind of ongoing when when there is a problem, um, who do you contact and what does that look like and what are the ongoing um, sort of supports that 
those um, systems and those companies offer. Um, the other thing I think um, that is, um, the other piece that sort of stands out for me in that um, needed capacities uh, piece is the reporting capacities that, um, you know, most everybody needs to run reports. And I think it's generally a pretty good, um, a pretty good indicator of how flexible it is to put information into a system to see how flexible it is to get information out of that system. Um, so I think that, you know, those are the two things that I would definitely sort of look for in a, in a case management system. And then the, the final thing is, um, you know, different ways that um, that system can check for um, data issues, data integrity, um, what are things that may be automated, what are things that um, you can customize within that system to make sure that the data that is going in is as, um, as accurate as it possibly can be. Okay. One thing I heard was essentially um, nobody, people, it would it behooves folks to find out what they should expect um, from case management systems because sometimes you know they've been in one world for a long time and so I, mm -hmm. I, what I heard what I heard was some concern of of folks just um, knowing how it can be a tool for them and 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 what they should expect from the case management system. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that I that I recommend here is to reach out to programs that are already using particular case management systems um, and learn from your peers over what works for them, what are their staffing, do, is that something that their in-house tech helps with, is there external support, that type of stuff is go to the community and use the community as a resource um, to learn about uh, this particular area. And this uh, case management systems um, are as mentioned again and again as we look at different areas and it, it heavily overlaps with a lot of the different type of technology uh, that we're covering. As we move into the production and supervision area of the baselines, the first thing there uh, definitely covers a lot of case management systems and even the second, uh, second one there which is calendaring. Um, sometimes those things are integrated in um, to case management systems as is occasionally document um, production. The next big thing that we're looking at is the technology that is used um, for supervision of legal work, production of legal work, and uh, this is one of the more extensive areas um, in the baselines. It covers um, case management systems a little more with some more uh, basic features that are added there including remote access to the system. Um, it covers calendaring, um, so having reminders for deadlines, appointments, that type of thing. There are many different pieces of software out there that do that. Um, and document production, effective use of productive software, development of a strategy to automate forms that you're going to be using again and again to cut down on the time used to create those forms, um, technology to assist staff who are collaboratively working on large projects. Um, is this something um, in-house where people are sharing through SharePoint and working on something collaboratively? Is this a secure um, Google Docs document where individuals are collaboratively editing it? Editing it? Um, is it something else entirely? Um, the creation of PDF documents as well as converting them into OCR, optical character recognition um, files that can be edited and the ability if allowed in your local court system to do electronic filing which can cut down on the, uh, the time cost significantly of doing filing. If your courts allow it, uh, it, it is a huge benefit time-wise to be able to take advantage of that. Um, there's also uh, timekeeping, which we are all really aware of with regards to uh, federal grants that we're on, and that type of timekeeping, the easier and more integrated it can be into our workflow, uh, the less time it takes to consolidate or work on later. Um, online legal research is also in that same category. It, so in this uh, supervision and production area, um, Jeff or Xander, what, what are some of the uh, things that you really see as kind of the most important of these basic features that we're looking at? 
Well, what I heard as a theme is that now that things are largely electronic, all of those things that are electronic can be used to help, you know, avoid malpractice. Um, you know, there should, it, it, you know, I know a lot of offices still have a big paper calendar in somebody's office that has everybody's court dates, which is fine as a backup. But any more systems, smart systems can help you make sure deadlines aren't missed. They can. It doesn't make sense for um, a supervising attorney to read well in detail everyone's divorce pleadings to make sure they're all good. Uh, but if people are using standard um, a standard, at least within that office set of pleadings, then you, you reduce the chance for, for significant mistakes. Um, timekeeping can be monitored, and this the use of um, data for supervision, including things like, I think it was Kristen Barrell who made a report that said, show me every week, every month, who, who had more than a certain amount of time entered and who had less than a certain amount of time entered, which I thought was, was subtle and smart, right, to go to the people who are, who are um, killing themselves and say, maybe, maybe we need to look at your caseload, and go to the people who haven't put their time in and say, maybe we need to look at compliance. <laughs> um, and then, uh, interesting, the online research, I'm making sure that um, people are doing that. That was, didn't come from me, of course, so, but uh, interesting, that the idea being making sure that the folks you supervise are up to date on the things they need to know and know how to look up precedents and know how to you know, what we used to call shepherdized cases. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, especially as you're dealing with um, some of the mid-size or larger um, organizations, there's a lot of opportunities to work there collaboratively. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, supervisors should know, right? At this point, mm -hmm. if the data is electronic, you should have a way to see it. Uh, anything to add there or suggestions, Andrew? Nope. Okay. So we've got um, a heavy emphasis in here on um, electronic uh, records um, as a lot more of our client uh, discussions are being done electronically. Um, there are several things to consider, uh, confidentiality, document retention, um, and policies regarding access. Who has access to that file? Do they need access to that file? Uh, what, what the defaults are that are set up in a system and um, what you can do to change or limit that, um, especially if you're working with outside counsel or anyone else that is, or uh, pro bono attorneys, other things like that. Um, those types of policies uh, need to be in place proactively it's going to save a lot of time when you're collaborating on larger things. Um, but the, the document retention is a very interesting one, especially since with physical files we uh, have it set up to where we often uh, purge, but all of the electronic systems tend to keep these files for very long uh, periods of time. So, and looking at the two areas of both confidentiality and privacy, um, although there's a lot of overlap between them, there's also some things that are unique to each of those areas. There may be other requirements that you need to look at with regards to local state um, data protection laws or uh, notification or breach, those type of things if uh, client data is lost in any way. Um, this is an area where it is, it's well worth trying to take a kind of scan of what's going on in your uh, state to see if there's anything to pay attention to uh, above and beyond the LSC um, guidelines also um, so that you put together a strategy for dealing with this electronic information. Um, is, is your instant messaging archived? Are your emails archived? How long are they archived for? How long does a sent um, email stick around? Is there a uh, limit on data size? When do you get rid of that data? Um, what are some of the best practices in this area or recommendations, uh, Xander or um, Jeff? Uh, well, you know, this really overlaps with security, and that includes things like we love it that we can work remotely. Um, how secure is where you're working remotely? Did you stick a bunch of stuff on a USB stick? Which, you know, some organizations just ban them entirely, uh, partly because it's one thing, you know, uh, 
if somebody steals an entire file drawer full of papers, they might have they might might have a hundred clients worth of information. But a single USB stick can have all of your clients' data. So um, there's there's our obligation to our clients to keep them safe and keep their information safe. There's also data breach notification laws in some states. Uh, so it has to. I'm not as worried about the 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 issue that gets gets brought up sometimes of like somebody trying to subpoena you or get it or that sort of thing. Much more worried about accidental accidental loss of data by um, USB keys or by maybe even printing out reports. You know, we remind people if you're if you if all you need to know is some data on a report, maybe you don't even need to include the client's name in that printout. Where does that printout go? Does somebody save it because they think it's you know want to refer to it later? Um, so those are um, you know <laughs> they're going to be growing issues, including um, understanding how we can protect them that data and how. Um, how it's stored. So long-term storage and encryption is, is growing in expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at the cases and what's happened, uh, a combination of, of personal identifiable information stored is needs to be treated like it's treasure. Mm -hmm. Now that, that is a great point. I dealt recently with a program um, that was being uh, asked to give some uh, information to a funder who funded several different programs. This, this was not LSE, this was a, a different local funder. Um, and the funder was really interested in trying to figure out how many unique clients were served over um, several different programs that they funded. And they originally just asked for it, entire like case file information, like who it is, uh, social security numbers, those type of things. Um, and we, yikes, we pushed yikes. back right we pushed back right away saying we're, we're absolutely not sharing that data, um, but we, we would be willing to work with the other funders and try to come up with a way to uh, generate a unique key that we could then share um, that is not reverse engineering, that cannot be reverse engineered to figure out client data. And even when you um, aggregate information, it's, it's very important to figure out how many details you're giving because once you merge that, what you think is private data with publicly available databases or information that can be found on social networks, um, Netflix found out really quickly a few years ago that someone was able to reverse engineer their anonymous data set and identify individual users, rental histories, and even things such as sexual preference from the data that was meant to be uh, um, anonymous. And that is the last thing that you want to do when trying to do something helpful like do a grant reporting. So having those policies in place, especially around personally identifiable information and how to anonymize it, um, helps you deal with those data requests that come later. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so the next one here is knowledge management systems. And once again, the, the baselines don't suggest a particular technology, but it's more a set of different things to look at um, while you are trying to share knowledge in your organization. That it must be able to store and retrieve uh, pleadings, briefs, motions, those things that are used again and again. That electronic access is available for internal forms and procedures, that it's available across the program, um, that there are access to electronic practice guides, and that you have some way to check the integrity, um, ideally both an automatic, automated way um, and some way that maybe users could uh, rate or give feedback on those um, form samples, those type of things. Um, we've seen a lot of different um, TIG grants over the last few years that have uh, implemented this in different ways. Um, we have a group coming up at the upcoming TIG conference that is looking at a way to do knowledge sharing inside of Drupal. Um, some uh, programs have used like a Google search appliance. Northwest Justice Project has a SharePoint um, installation that has a brief bank and some knowledge sharing things there. Uh, the technology to do search on these has increased 
drastically in the past 10 years, so being able to find these things is much easier. Uh, but there's also really a challenge in how do you create a community around um, providing these, sharing them um, individually, what do you do on the uh, change management side to help individuals uh, kind of work this into their workflow so that it is seen as both helpful and beneficial to them, but as part of their nat natural process of what they're doing. Um, any tips or suggestions for setting up this kind of knowledge sharing? Yeah, so one thing that if, you know, if groups don't have a knowledge management system in place um, now, one of the first things that I think is really important to kind of think through and look at is what are the tools that staff are using either professionally or in their personal lives to do this kind of, um, you know, sort of data management because everybody is. We all have, um, you know, electronic records um, or paper records that we are managing on an everyday basis. And if you have a staff who is very, very comfortable with Google, um, just as an example, and who may use uh, Google even if they don't use it, if you have Outlook, for example, as your, as your main work, um, as your main work uh, email, but everybody on your staff knows and uses Google in their personal life, it is worth thinking, you know, what, which one, uh, you know, which one will the staff really use and implement the most easily. Um, so just sort of thinking through and, and talking to your staff about what they're using on a day-to-day -day basis, both in, you know, their personal and their professional life. And then also, you know, thinking through, regardless of the knowledge management system that you decide to implement, um, thinking long-term about what training you're going to need to support that implementation over time. Um, because, you know, there will be the, there's always that initial, we're converting, this is great, and, you know, the training that goes along with that. But as we know, SharePoint changes over time, um, Google changes over time, Drupal changes over time. Being able to support those changes and to kind of, you know, as hearkening back to the tech plan, having that in, having that sort of documented somewhere about what, um, what supports and trainings you're going to use is really, um, can be really helpful for just the long-term implementation. I'll add, I think no matter what you choose, you'll notice that it's not very specific in the baseline. No matter what you choose, these need gardeners. Um, no matter what platform it is, there needs to be somebody who's, who's keeping things organized and keeping track of things. I love the idea of people being able to rate resources to help surface the things that really matter. Because the hardest part, part about all this is people forgetting that it's there. Yeah, anything you can do to, to make it more a part of people's workflow uh, definitely helps. Another thing to definitely consider here is um, how this is done um, regarding things like confidentiality. Is If you're a smaller program, I've seen people um, work with several different organizations and then they have to put in a process for um, retracting or um, anonymizing particular forms or pleadings, those type of things. Um, I've definitely seen this work a, a little more successfully uh, internally to single programs where they don't have as many issues there around the confidentiality. But once again, this needs to also um, have an electronic records policy. If there is confidential information in there, it needs to be um, considered and sometimes removed or scrubbed depending on your other policies or practices. The next area that we've got here um, is a is legal information websites, um, statewide collaboration, services offered, um, intake, those um, types of um, fundamental basic resources out there. We see several different models um, in different states. Um, some organizations um, work on the model that Washington Law Help is on uh, with support of Pro Bono Net. Um, there are other states um, that are using a Drupal knowledge 
or a Drupal website system um, either independently through using the DLAW template that was um, developed many years back and is supported uh, mostly by Urban Insight um, or hosted through um, Urban Insight, but having legal information available um, on websites is part of that basic foundation that is out there. Um, and new to this update on the baselines is also um, looking at social media as part of that outreach and availability. Um, one of the things that is most helpful to clients is going to where they are. And we have found here at Northwest Justice Project that taking and putting videos over on YouTube where people are already searching for information about foreclosure, about record sealing, about rental disputes um, has definitely increased the visibility of those resources and allowed them to reach the community where the community is already searching. So we have this uh, tradition of creating our own websites that have become pillars of the community, but also there, there's this trend now in um, finding ways to take some of those resources and share them uh, where people are living socially online uh, so that as they look for legal help, they find those resources that we create for individuals. Um, thoughts here either on the website uh, side or on the um, social media side? On social media, I just wanted to add, if the baseline say there should be a plan, right? So the baseline is as a plan. Your plan could be we're not going to do any significant legal uh, work in any of these, but the plan probably should include we're going to make sure we own our name, we have our own site. Maybe you only tweet a couple times a year, like um, there's our major fundraising drive is in March, that sort of thing. Uh, but I think I, the, I think the thought behind the baselines is that. It, it shouldn't be ignored. No matter what you think fits best with your client population and your 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 technology resources and skills, um, it's def it, it's where people are, as you said. And and uh, it the baselines encourage you to have a plan for how you're gonna how you're gonna handle that. Right. That's very important to point out that it it doesn't require a specific um, strategy or specific outreach, but it should definitely be part of part of the plan. And if you don't claim those names, someone else, often with uh, less helpful intentions towards our clients, will grab those names and will be redirecting resources um, and clients in other ways. Yeah, and the only thing that I would really add to that is, um, you know, regardless of what um, online assistance you're looking to provide, whether that's through a statewide website um, or through social media um, or through your own, um, your own website, that, um, you know, that uh, looking at the, ensuring that there's a variety of accessibility to that information, whatever information you put up is incredibly important, that, you know, we are kind of very quickly moving past the point where putting up um, handouts that you provide in, you know, a waiting room is going to engage your um, your users or folks who are visiting your online spaces. And so just thinking about as you are deciding what information, if any, that you want to put out there, um, you know, sort of taking a look at what are the ways to ensure that people who are looking at it online can get the most help out of your materials is uh, is really important. Okay, um, and we're gonna we're gonna cover uh, grant reporting a little bit at the end and a little bit on the on the fundraising aspects. Um, but if if social media ends up being a part of that um, fundraising plan for individuals, um, it it doesn't work if that is the only thing you're using it for. The more um, client helpful things that you are doing throughout the year uh, that really draw people in and create an audience there, uh, the better chance that you'll get any feedback. Um, I definitely see individuals try to use social media for fundraising and it, it is not 
actually that successful there. It can be part of an overall strategy, uh, but it is more useful in getting legal information or sharing your successes. A lot of people find the work that we do at Northwest Justice Project through us talking about successful cases, client stories, those types of things, and then also sharing publicly available trainings or resources or community events that we're involved in where they can come ask questions, be part of a clinic, something to that effect. Those are more uh, more successful uses there. Um, That's a great point. And, you know, social media has so many good metrics because everybody who uses social media a lot <laughs> really yeah, there's a ton of tools to know how successful you are. So you can you can see uh, the return on investment with a, a host of tools to see that. So it's a good good point that if all you do is uh, occasionally ask for money and there's nothing else useful in your channel, nobody's going to pay attention. Right. Well, I think Jeff hits on a very important point here that goes back even to our planning section. That if you were doing yearly updated planning. Most of these systems that we're talking about, your case management system, your social media, your online uh, publicly available website, those all have wonderful analytics that are available and you can put information about where you are, what your target goals are for the next year, uh, those things, and then use that data-driven approach for strategic planning over a multi-year period of time. You can actually test and see, was this successful, was this helpful, were these campaigns being used? Um, that is really one of the things that having that at least one full-time FTE um, can help you do is monitor, collect that data, and then help you make strategic decisions based on that data long term. Um, the next section that we've got here um, covers uh, pro bono support and the types of technology um, that we'll be using to support pro bono lawyers, um, that you should have a website that includes features of allowing pro bono lawyers to review available um, cases and volunteer that posts training and resources, um, a case management system that allows you to uh, track referred cases and time spent on them, a strategy to share um, client and case data securely with pro bono attorneys. So there's a lot of overlap with some of the topics that we've talked about um, earlier here, but it has a pro bono focus. Um, and then a program to provide assistance and um, support in this representation, um, which may include things like automated documents or access to a brief bank, um, providing volunteer attorneys with training and resources such as web conferencing, video conferencing, um, hosted online trainings, um, archive trainings, those type of things. If you are creating a um, training on how to do a particular type of um, housing cases that you do in-house to all of your housing attorneys, if there's a way to record that and then make it available to pro bono attorneys um, as they come on or as they do support for you, that can help assist them significantly in learning these new areas of law. Um, any, any thoughts or ideas here or uh, interest, interesting ways people should be considering to use technology to support their pro bono um, lawyers? Well, I'll just say that, I mean, by definition, they're probably not probably not sitting in your office and they're, they're not inside your program in, in the other training and support ways either. And so it would seem that technology really lends itself uh, to creating more of a team with pro bono. There's so many platforms. There's so many people trying to, to um, solve this problem and, and support better interaction and training. Uh, with pro bono attorneys that range all the way from the, letting them volunteer for cases online, giving them resources. I, I don't, there's a real wide variety of, of, um, of tools out there. And I think from the baselines, reading the baselines perspective, it gets into some details of things that to plan for um, in pro bono. So there's certainly the idea that one of the ways we can increase uh, 
volunteerism and support good results from pro bono is uh, is to make sure that the technology tools we have are made available to them. And then hopefully you're you're lucky and you have a panel <laughs> that also is good at using technology because uh, you know, we, we need that mm -hmm. from our from our partners too. Mm -hmm. Well, and just considering a, a little bit of technology training as you onboard a pro bono attorney um, can go a long way in saving you time when they would be asking questions later. Yep, good point. I mean, and it's even something to think about as you upgrade or add other systems and as you do that strategic planning for the year. If you're looking at a unified communication system next year, is there is there a requirement that you want to put into the RFP that allows a pro bono attorney to possibly um, take a hotline call remotely from their office? Is that being aware of what those technologies are allow you while you're doing technology um, upgrading and planning to find ways to bring volunteers in and use them most effectively long term. So this is one of the two areas that we're going to cover um, training, but there, there's a heavy emphasis in several different areas here on training, on assessment, standards, policies um, geared towards effective use. The training should be in the budget. Um, the, this should be a line item very similar to kind of your continuing legal education that there should be some type of um, continuing technology training that is out there um, and it should cover things like online research document production and as just mentioned pro bono support which is why we why I put into kind of this section here and then covered a little bit later is that it, it's part of the overall plan and how you deal with technology um, any any best practices or things that you would mention as helpful towards training and technology? We've, we've seen uh, the growth of offerings here as well. Um, I know talking with, I know it doesn't sound like training, but talking with Anna Heinlein, she was talking about a tool that's built into Google Tools now that's basically like just-in-time help where it'll sort of do a screen video for you on using that tool. So technology is getting so much smarter uh, now that um, it, maybe that's going to be, maybe some of these new tools are going to make it easier than having your whole staff do um, a half day or a full day webinar on using their their um, software tools. But um, uh, getting it in the budget is the first is the first battle. We're going to do some training of people because I, I know this is one of those things that people struggle to to squeeze in. It's interesting that in the baseline, particularly mentioned were training and how to use the online research tools, document production, and how to use um, and supporting pro bonos and using technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how there is a great assessment things happening. There's people who are partnering with uh, actual pro bono technology technologists from pro bono firms from CIOs to help with their tech assessments. Um, people can copy standards, and I know um, LSNTAP is a good resource for that too. So, um, standards and policies. Uh, increasingly, I think people are going to be asking you to show show them uh, the, the policies you have, and and ask what you do to make sure people know about them. Mm -hmm. Train. <laughs> yeah, and we've we've got a good uh, comment here from William Guyton um, that covers the uh, that mentions a litigant portals or some way for. Um, litigants to access information online and then um, web RTC um, as a uh, real-time communication um, opportunities that are available there. Um, I've seen programs set up um, uh, remote counseling, pro bono work through web RTC, very, very useful tool there overall. Um, so security, is, there's a whole section um, on security here, and it is definitely um, essential to the baselines, um, maintaining backups, updating software, educating staff proactively, and limiting permissions on documents, files, those uh, individual things as uh, needed only. Um, having these things in place ahead of time helps significantly. Um, we've definitely run into programs um, that have 
waited until there was a crisis and then ended up spending much more time or much more money dealing with that crisis uh, because one of these four things was really missed. Um, the security section breezes over some of the really important stuff that is there and we've got full webinars on this but it includes things like firewalls, antivirus, anti-spam, anti-spyware, um, backup and data retention policies as part of that. Um, data destruction is one of those policies that a lot of organizations should really look at. We're going to be um, hopefully coming up with a data destruction policy here at LSNTAP um, that people can customize in the first part of next year for electronic data specifically. Um, it, it is often housed long term and not necessarily uh, removed where we have a, usually have a great process for getting rid of physical files. Um, as part of that security, I would definitely recommend looking into a bring your own device policy. Um, a lot, a few organizations that I know have just said you can't use your personal devices at all, and that tends to push towards kind of a shadow IT where people just don't tell IT that they're doing it. Uh, we found that although the, the baselines don't require that you allow people to use their own device, but at least proactively uh, consider, be aware of that type of use, and if you can educate people to use it uh, smartly and securely, um, you may be able to work with them very collaboratively, and there's opportunities also there to install security protocols or things that if a device is lost, it can be remotely wiped. Those type of things can be proactively planned into your policies there. Um, on, on the security side, are there things that um, either of you would like to add here? Well, I, if I, it, you know, I'm torn, right? Because as NLADA, as a, as a, a co-chair of that, we don't want to create a bunch of grant requirements that make it hard for people to get other work done and, and you know, yet another checklist. On the other hand, if I, I will say just as a recommendation, um, uh, these aren't enough by themselves. As you said, it's really kind of a laundry list of things you should know about. So if, if I were to write a recommendation, it would be, somebody responsible for technology in your program should it attend at least one security webinar every year and 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 it's rapidly changing when i first started with this it was kind of chicken little the sky is falling not that many real examples of people being held ransom uh, or being targeted with attacks and that's all changed uh, just today i was speaking with a program that's getting they're being targeted right now with um, uh, you know, the, the phishing, which seems to be literally targeted at them, like everyone in their in their program is getting really convincing phishing emails. So it's it's that's absolutely essential. Um, and BYOD, I think the the general recommendation is figure out a policy um, or just don't don't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, William makes a wonderful point here, which is that uh, multi-factor authentication should really really be a standard there. Um, making it more difficult for people to gain access um, and strongly consider um, the cloud as an option um, for both applications and for um, backups. The, the baselines uh, do not require that you use either the cloud or on-premises solutions, uh, but there is a lot to be said for um, letting uh, experts externally um, host at least one of your backup copies and I strongly suggest that you have a, at least two different backup um, systems available but the cost of that cloud hosting and the options that are there for uh, redundancy uh, the cost has went way down and the features are incredible um, so it is it's well worth considering there and can be done very securely they are, and this is. I think this has changed in the last decade too. From, you know, you might be as secure <laughs> with a, a a computer locked under somebody's desk, but nowadays the, the the ways that people get at your it has gotten so much more sophisticated that it takes expert systems to do it. Um, and uh, this you can have you can add redundancy pretty easily. I think William's point is really good uh, that. These are experts, and now that I now that I see how complicated it is to keep keep track of uh, all the potential issues and threats, and do you know what 
the underlying software updates are and what are the um, the errors that are being patched that you need to make sure of. I think those are really, really great points. Great. Well, William points out Microsoft Foundation is uh, giving uh, $5,000 a year towards nonprofits. They're for using um, 365 or Azure. Um, the hosting costs through ASW, through Amazon services, is super cheap there also. Um, it, it, there are many options out there worth looking at um, in those areas. But you got to have an expert. Don't if you if you throw your own stuff up in the cloud, you're just uh, uh, expand expanding your attack vector. <laughs> yes, so. yes. And ha having someone on staff that is that is able to make sure that's done securely, um, or an external uh, consultant that specializes in that. Um, although a a consultant hours and times will um, add up very quickly. Um, one of the next areas that is covered is trainings, and I'm uh, going to be un unmuting, hopefully, William here so that um, if he's got additional comments, please just tie it, chime in. Uh, you should be unmuted, William. I am. Uh, Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, there's. Uh, we've had a full webinar on security, and we'll continue to do them every year as the technology updates. Um, any, anything else to add on the security side? Not unless we want to go all afternoon. <laughs> okay. Um, so, <laughs> Just one being quiet. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next next two that I've got here are on um, training. So one thing that's interesting here is the community legal education um, aspect of of this um, talks about looking at effective use of technology such as online uh, conferencing, videos, and other use of uh, appropriate technology. Um, if you're dealing with a very large geographic area. Um, it is often difficult to reach out to clients across that uh, geographic area. If you can take a training that you're doing at a community center or an outreach event um, and find some way to either record or stream that, um, you can turn into a training for Seattle into a statewide training um, and allow it to have much more impact over the next six or 12 months. So that looking at video uh, archival and streaming is definitely something that should be considered to um, help your impact. The other thing to think about on the training side is that there is that this mentions looking at the standards that are out there for lawyers. Um, the ABA does a great job of talking about um, what lawyers must do to keep up with technology, and that should be part of the training that is given to your in-house, um, to your lawyers, is that training on technology with regards to um, ethics, if they're doing research on jurors, how can they interact or not interact on social media, um, if they're uh, interacting with judges online, what does your state um, say there about the use of social media, it, it's divided in, in different states. Um, those type of things are important to keeping your lawyers uh, well-educated and uh, ethically okay. And I think some of this goes back, you'll notice there's kind of a theme in the baselines that, that has, sort of has to do with efficiency. Um, Technology should give you the opportunity to be a good steward of the resources you're given, and and maybe it makes sense to at least have a, 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 a the, the ability to uh, broadcast or record that important information you're imparting to others, uh, as opposed to send the same person to go to drive five different places. Sometimes you need to drive. Sometimes you need to do it in person. But there's some there's some uh, uh, efficiency that can be gained here. Definitely. Um, the next area that we're looking at is has been one of the more popular ones that we've done trainings on um, is communications, um, both email, collaborative tools, um, having tools for testing tech issues that are out there, um, having internal communication uh, mechanisms that allow staff to share web conference, um, having a system for tracking. Uh, technology um, systems, also dealing with a telephone system, routing by language, 
um, relay reports on busy or dropped um, calls, after hour messages, um, and then also consider um, online intake. It, it does not require, but it should be part of your plan to at least consider um, online intake there, which is a, a very uh, popular option, especially when you consider uh, triaging and providing people with self-help resources um, as you're determining whether or not they might be eligible through that system. There was a, there's a program in California that uh, they were tell, telling me that they were trying to improve their language access that they they were they were only up to 14 different languages that they could route people to when they called in. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is a, 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 the accessibility can be so much improved now with the um, the way different phone systems. I wouldn't even call them phone systems anymore. Communication systems are getting so sophisticated can be configured and I wanted to add on online intake it there is consolidation and there are efforts to coordinate so it's 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 um, there are times when you need a specific online intake for a specific program even a specific program within a specific program but um, I, I hope that anyone attending will figure out what efforts are underway in their area to see if they can be um, part of a, of a larger effort definitely And one thing to really also consider in this um, is the expansion of mobile devices, um, both for your lawyers and for clients. Um, we are seeing that there is a significant number of clients that a, a smartphone may be the only internet access that they have, and they may have very limited um, data or data that they're accessing through free Wi-Fi. So designing your legal um, systems so that they are mobile accessible is essential at this point and considering way, ways to reach out to clients through mobile devices or allow them to get information to you via mobile devices. Um, we, we have had two or three instances uh, in the last year where uh, clients have um, needed to text information in to a particular um, lawyer because they lost access to their other forms of communication. So at least considering options there um, is essential um, as that's often a way that clients are uh, interacting and communicating. So the next area that we've got here um, is software and technology around administration, um, which really covers two different areas. One is on um, your accounting side, payroll, timekeeping, those types of things, general ledger, accounts receivable, um, client trust accounts, um, tracking, reporting, budgeting, expenditures. Um, this is essential for all of your grant reporting. Um, the better technology that you have in place here, it can cut down on your need to try to uh, collect data from several different sources as you're doing uh, grant reporting later. Um, we've had several discussions on the LS Tech email list about what accounting software and what best practices people use. Um, this is one of those areas that I am I'm least knowledgeable but there are other experts in our community that deal with this all the time. And it's worth reaching out to the community to figure out what software meets your needs there and can work into your budget in this area. Um, it's closely related to um, fundraising and grant reporting. Um, it, it talks about in this same administration um, section um, looking at grant maintenance, tracking milestones, keeping uh, reimbursements, cost calculations, those types of things in um, a centralized uh, system, and also uh, putting together general plans for fundraising, marketing, outreach, um, and then electronically uh, tracking information of your, your donors, your contact history, and then the ability to generate reports and do data-driven uh, improvements of those systems over time.
And I, I will say that this, this is an area where um, I see a lot of legal services just moving into the uh, fundraising uh, development outreach portion uh, towards donors um, in a very new way that uh, traditional nonprofits or the uh, NTC N10 community um, has many years of experience there. And it's one of the reasons that we try to open up the email list to um, individuals outside of legal services because other nonprofits have much more experience in this area and it is worth reaching out to them to figure out what works and then try to bring those best practices in-house here to legal services. And Brian, I just wanted to add back on the accounting stuff that, you know, I think some this, you know, the baselines were developed with LSC, who's a they're, they came from them. They're they're a funder. They probably don't want to walk into a grantee and see that the books are in um, someone's un, unintelligible handwriting. But also, you know, I've heard some, you know, there's some some bad things that happen, and if that information is stored in an understandable, well organized electronic them. It also should be the case that problems can be identified before uh, they get really serious and end up detracting from from the organization's mission because you're missing dollars or um, you're having too much trouble with budgeting, which is super complicated. And uh, this is not in the baseline, but I did want to just say on the development software, I really encourage people to talk to people who actually have that piece of software and learn about their experiences. You, you really you haven't saved yourself any time or effort if it turns out that, you know, the solution that you are trying to use is too hard for, too difficult for anyone to really understand. So uh, definitely reach out to your friends. So as, as we are starting to uh, wrap up here, I'm going to put links to these selected resources into the, into the chat um, they cover a little bit more in depth some of the topics that we've talked about today. Um, I, I'll put those in as clickable links here in a second. Um, I definitely recommend that people check out the LS Untap YouTube um, channel and tap videos. It has over 100 videos of our past webinars there. and Many of them go in depth on topics that we've talked about today. Um, and I would like to open it up to questions generally and encourage people um, to if they're not already there, to join the um, LSNTAB Discuss email group that is hosted through Google Groups. If you have a Google account, you can go there directly and, then, and join, or if you do not, just uh, send me an email and I'm happy to add you. Um, are, are there any questions uh, that individuals have as we uh, get close to wrapping up here? Let me say real quick, in case, in case we weren't clear, the baselines are recommendations that are designed to be helpful to programs. Um, they're not in the form of, of the grantee requirements. We, we hope, I hope that with our help and Brian's help and the community's help that they stir uh, conversations in each program about technology needs and, and I ho hope that they turn out to be some good guidance for, for future planning. Um, and if, if not, or there's other issues, I'm also available to respond to questions. I also also finally want to make a plug for this uh, the email group that Brian helps manage. It's essential if there's anybody who isn't already on the LSN Tap um, technology group. It's uh, it's something I consider uh, essential to anybody who works in technology and legal aid to to stay up with uh, what's going on and get instant feedback on problems and suggestions. Um, any any final thoughts, William? Anything that you would like to add? Um, I'm kind of with Jeff. We could we could go off on a bunch of tangents, but I, th I think you've hit the high points. Um, I, I will reiterate what Jeff said. I'm certainly available to anybody at, in any capacity, uh, having spent the last what, 12, 13 years of my career in legal aid in a technology capacity. Uh, unlike Jeff and Brian, I'm the non-lawyer in the, uh, of the amongst the geeks, uh, but, uh, but I'm certainly willing to help. Hopefully that means Excellent. you have that. <laughs> well, yeah, 
Yeah, I, it, it's always disheartening to the new attorneys when they show up and they're like, well, why don't you become a lawyer? And I'm like, I, I just can't take the pay cut. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's rough. I know. It is. <laughs> uh, no, well, well. Thank you both. Also, a, a huge thank you to Xander who had to step off at uh, the turn of the hour, um, but we are always available to help answer questions. Um, also, to help people um, write RFPs to uh, find um, solutions that are out there. If there's any of these things that people want to help. Uh, implement in their program and um, that's what LSNTAP and that's what this community overall is there to do is is to help you both with um, getting up to and implementing the baselines and then also doing integrate innovative stuff uh, in this field to help clients so. and and join us in San Antonio oh yes the TIG conference is coming up here next month um, I will be out there I will be there as well. You coming, Jeff? I'll I'll be there, and I Sweet. hope that anybody who's um, all the folks attending or watching this, if if you think you have found a good solution to meet the needs of the baselines, uh, uh, tell us about it on LSNTAP. Definitely. Well, thank you both, and um, you enjoy your holidays, and we'll see you in Texas. Thank you. See you soon. See you, Brian. See you, Jeff. Bye, guys. Bye, William. Bye.